Dude, I was so excited when I saw you on my calendar that I was going to get to hang out and talk with you. I mean, <laughs> you are like, you're like an Elon Musk type person. I mean, <laughs> Hyperloop, 3D printed houses, floating <laughs> cities. How did you get so cool, man? <laughs> Dude, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's just a hype. No, I'm kidding. Um, I just enjoy what I do. I do, and I actually think um, there's a lot that can be done in, uh, in innovation in my industry, especially. So anything related to the, like architecture, engineering, and construction, I do believe it needs some love from an innovation perspective. And so, I you know I'm not saying that I, I am the innovator, but I'm tr- I would love to, I'm, I like to be part of it. You know, and it's for me it's very important. So when people ask you like what you do, how do you respond to that? I'm an engineer that loves innovation. <laughs> That's. Uh, <laughs> I am. I mean, I am an engineer, and I actually enjoy very much innovation. And I, I try to integrate um, different fields within each other, right? So um, some of my background is not just uh, civil engineers or uh, uh, marine engineering; it's uh, also systems engineering. And I think uh, it does allow me to understand better how different uh, um, components or different systems. Uh, are integrated within each other, and uh, you know that's what I like to do in uh, in uh, in the industry as well. That is very cool. I've got a lot of systems engineering experience, but I have no structural engineering experience at all. I think uh, you know it's a it's a broader term, right? Like systems means what it can be um, like a digital system. It can be a very complex system, like a, I don't know, the International Space Station, right? And so and it can also be an organization. Organization is a system. Our body is a system, right? Composed of like different subsystems that, you know, working together make the function of the system higher than the function of the individual subsystem, right? So I think it, at, a, at a certain point, it's, uh, it's going to become to like a level where you're going to have specializations and it's good to be highly specialized in a certain way. But it's also good to make sure that all of these niches are integrated properly because you want to end product that actually work, right? And uh, that is able to achieve those requirements. So I think uh, that's that's what I, the way I see also the industry itself. It's uh, it's highly complex, is uh, clustered with a lot of niches and uh, uh, with a lot of new problems, such as you know the seawater level rising, for example, of the shortage of uh, uh, of uh, labor. As well as uh, you know, um, transportation is still uh, relying on uh, methods that have been developed, uh, uh, you know, almost hundred years ago. So we should actually innovate, and we should use different technologies and integrate them together. That is so cool. I'm excited to talk about the floating cities, but I first <laughs> want to know, like, how did you get involved in the Hyperloop project? Uh, they called me. They called you. I got. <laughs> I got called. Yeah, yeah, literally, literally. I remember receiving. It was either a call or an email uh, from the recruiting team, and they said that they were looking for a person that had not just experience from like a, a bridge and structure engineering perspective, but um, experience from like a health monitoring systems perspective. And you know, I I just had finished the one of the biggest structural health monitoring systems that exists actually in the world, in New York on the Tappan Zee Bridge, which is which uh, which was um, still under construction at the time. And so uh, working on that gave me like a, an edge over, I think, uh, the competition overall. But also it really gave me perspective of how such a huge infrastructure project um, can and need to be monitored for the lifespan. And, you know, how that can be then reapplied on other type of infrastructures. And Hyperloop was an example. You know, once you have... Uh, uh, high speed <laughs> um, transportation system that work with uh, such a sophisticated technology and such a new technology. You want to make sure that um, everything is monitored and uh, checked and uh, logged properly to a level that it's basically similar to what you have in uh, in the famous black boxes in, in the, into the airplanes, right? So those are like a data governance and policies in place that, that will allow you to really track everything. And uh, it's, it was important to have the same on, on the Hyperloop. And so that's uh, what I worked on primarily, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty rare to find somebody who's creative, intelligent, but also enjoys structure and order. Like those are typically, you get really creative people on one end, really organized people on the other. So to have like a perfect blend of those, that, that would make you the, 
an excellent fit for that project. <laughs> One question when you were talking about it, you said, you know, the structural engineer is mentioned a lot in your bio. I don't know the term super well. Um, but I'm curious, is there a difference between structural engineer and architect? Yeah. I mean, we are a very symbiotic in the sense that um, we tend to make sure that whatever is um, designed from the architect, from architecture perspective, meaning you're going to have a building, for example, and the building has uh, this beautiful facade and uh, the um, layout of the interiors are done in a certain way, but then you have to make sure that the building stands, right? So who's going to design the slabs? Who is going to design the beams? Who is going to design the columns, the foundations? Who is going to design the core that takes care of uh, all of the lateral forces, and then is the one that basically is used to allocate the elevators, right? So uh, that's the job of a structural engineer from a building perspective. Same thing goes into when you have a bridge. You know, bridges normally have less involvement from an architecture perspective. So we normally are involved from, like, let's say, the architectural design to the structural design as well. But let's say stadiums. Stadiums, architects and engineers are very well involved because it's a heavily parametric uh, effort that requires a lot of iterations. And so, you know, what is the architecture feature becomes also the structural feature. But you want to make sure that both specialties speak together in order to basically make sure that it doesn't only it doesn't only comes out as as a cool design, but also as a safe design. And so that's uh, that's the role of a uh, structural engineer. I want to get a little bit nerdier for just one second. Is structural engineer like a designation or some sort of thing you pass, license you have, like an architect? I know there's like an architecture license that you have, right? Are they different licenses or are they the same thing? They are. No, there are. And as a matter of fact, we go into the rabbit hole now. So um, depending on where you are in the world, uh, you have you need a license, right? So in the United States, it's called the PE. It's the Professional Engineering License. You have to go through a certification uh, uh, program. It's a test. Uh, that goes uh, along the day uh, in two sets of uh, um, basically all, almost, I think, if I remember correctly, it's like a, it's a six hours in the morning, six hours are in the afternoon. Uh, and then you have you basically allowed to stamp drawings that are um, basically um, are the one used then to be submitted to the Department of Buildings or the Department of Transportation. Basically, they're going to have your signature and you're liable for that. But also, that means that you are the person that checked everything and you're basically uh, assuring or insuring, actually, that everything is done as per code and as per uh, you know engineering standards. Then we have another one, which is the structural engineering license. Uh, it's required in only only in certain states. For example, in New York, you can get it after five years of experience with a PE. Uh, if you go in California, it's mandatory. It's actually even more important than the PE license. Uh, if you go in other places in the world, it's not required. For example, uh, I'm Italian, and in Italy. Um, the structural engineer is also the professional engineer and, uh, you know, basically allow you to work on every realm of uh, the civil engineering industry. Uh, once you go into, for example, the structural engineering certification in uh, Illinois, California, or other states, that required only for certain specific type of structures or only for uh, certain clients, such as government type of structure for hospitals or uh, um, government, government buildings. So, has certain requirements or for certain type of bridges. If you're Illinois, you can get only certain type of bridges designed if you have the SC. If you have the PE, it's a little bit smaller. So it really depends on the states. Okay. No, thanks. That's a good overview of it. Well, it, was, it was a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, no, but I wanted to know. I mean, it's kind of, you know, you're just like, in my head, I'm like, there's people that build buildings and there's a team of them and I'm sure they do different things. But it's good to know, especially since we're about to talk about like, cities that are floating. Um, but right before we get into the cities that are floating, what did you do with 3D printed structures? Did you do work there? Well, I've been, uh, I've been getting interested in that from when I started to work uh, uh, with Hyperloop. Um, so with Hyperloop, we started to have some ideas of how to optimize a certain uh, structural elements or members. I'm not going to get too much into the detail of that. But um, and basically, 3D printed became uh, um, you know, one of the solutions, or I would say one of the options of doing that. And so I got exposed to that when it was like, I think, uh, 2018, more or less. And um, you know, I got hooked. Uh, I loved it. I loved the idea. I, lo I saw like a great potential from like a, um, an, you know, from a, an expedited point of view in terms of uh, construction processes. 
And, um, and then I started to try to be exposed as much as possible until uh, just recently uh, working for a nonprofit company in, uh, in Madagascar. We literally just finished the first uh, 3D printed school. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was cool. I work with two uh, very talented architects. They're almost my age. You know, it's, uh, it's very hard to find, uh, I would say, uh, older generations to actually be exposed or be interested to be exposed in this type of technologies. And so it's, uh, it's a very young environment. It's a very young industry, not just because it's composed mainly by um, uh, younger professionals, but also because it's a very young industry itself. It's, it was born recently, only, uh, only five years ago, from a, a construction perspective. So yeah, it's it's good to be exposed with that. Yeah, I got to do an interview. I think two or three years ago, I had seen there was a three D printed house on Zillow that was yes, being sold in Long Island. And, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I had him on the show, and like he explained it to me and everything how they did it. Uh, but I thought it was super fascinating because once you get robots that can build these houses, you know, you just they'll improve over time. They can become semi autonomous, and then you can just print entire neighborhoods and it would be really really neat to to see that happen especially in the emerging uh, countries countries that don't have the the amenities that the wealthier countries have as they come online and join the economy um, it would actually be better even for us like in wealthier countries because you have more players in the game there's more money in the market and so i think it's pretty exciting that we're sort of like improving humanity in a very real way that's that's true. I know you know it's fascinating also to say that you know right now we're using only certain components like you know it's a it's a it's a cement based mortar right. But then once you want to start to print with the more of a Adobe style materials or more clayish materials or uh, geopolymers materials, there is there is there are, there's a lot of I mean there are a lot of researchers that are going into that right now, and. Um, I do believe that in general, the construction industry will get to be more automated or it will definitely need the help and support of automation and uh, robotization, uh, not just from like um, uh, off-site manufacturing perspectives, but also from a site manufacturing perspective. You know, if, uh, if you have to replace a component instead of waiting for the component to come, you can actually 3D print it. Imagine that, right? Like if something like a gear broke in... Uh, it breaks into the like a, a caterpillar. Instead of um, waiting for the replacement, you're gonna receive the file from caterpillar. Right, everything is of course protected by IP, and you know you can only print the user on a caterpillar and stuff like that. But then you know you use the right type of uh, um, layers for or materials that compose basically the filaments for the printer, and you can uh, print metal and you can use it as a replacement. Oh yeah, G uh, G E. I think I think it's G E. My team can correct me if I'm wrong. But they, the the turbines, the airplane engines, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were printing parts so that they didn't have to ship them. And I was like, that is so cool. Yeah, imagine how that can disrupt the supply chain as well, right? Where now we're like overwhelmed by uh, problems related to supply chain, and we're very much still involved uh, uh, in transportation that come through vessels. Right, so you have boats that ship things from uh, Taiwan, from the port of Rotterdam, into the United States or into Australia. And, you know, it takes time, and you know, digitalization can cut those time and can really uh, improve uh, not just the speed of the supply chain itself, but I think it can really improve the speed of construction overall. Yeah, and I was. Uh, having a conversation about the molecular beverage printers, like you take a cup, you put it under, and it can print like anything essentially yeah. um, as as a liquid for your beverage. It's a company called Canna, C A N A. And I first I thought like, oh man, Coca Cola is probably going to have them assassinated or something. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then he pointed out to me that like he's actually removing the middleman of transportation and cutting their costs because now they can just license their formula directly to your house and then they get their money. So Indeed. As, that's, that's an interesting thing. I haven't really considered transportation to be a middleman, but it definitely is. It's a cost it that's it associated in, the, in between you and the consumer. And it's highly unreliable, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, unless we... Think about Amazon, but <laughs> beside Amazon, it's really it's really highly unreliable. Oh yeah, and there's some interesting business models too. Um, I talked to somebody who is mining um, minerals of some sort, 
yeah. in remote locations. And when their caterpillars would break down, they would spend and they would spend an insane like we're talking 10, 20, 50, 100,000 dollars to get a part there because the longer that that's down, the more money they're losing at scale. So they would private jets would fly the part, you know, a thousand dollar part there. And if you had a 3D printer, man, that that's entirely over. Yeah, I mean, look, of course, the thing is, we we have to think it totally and also like, a, uh, I would say, more objectively, right? Like it, it can really help, but I do believe that you still need the human interventions, right? Yeah. Like it, it, the, the involvement of humans will still be needed, but it will streamline a lot of processes, such as the one you just mentioned, or other processes in the in the construction uh, sequences, for example, which honestly, I think it's a, it's a good thing in the sense that, um, you know, before um, sitting uh, on a desk and designing things, I actually spent a lot of time on site. And I've seen from uh, off-site manufacturing uh, facilities to actually pure heavy construction sites. And the job is like, like it's, an, it's, it's tiring. It, you cannot do it for, you know, uh, all of your life at a certain point. It, it gets to a point where, um, you know, the younger generation takes over and you become more of a superintendent, but then you still spend time on site. And, you know, you will still need those people on site to, of course, oversee the processes. But, I mean, I see certain, uh, certain jobs and I, and I ask myself how we can really have like a, a human being such the, you know, the labor that are doing the work right now to be used in a way that is, uh, that can be more um, uh, enhancing for the, for that specific human being. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, it's like a, the production lines into a factory. How enhancing can be spending time 12 hours in, in front of like a, a conveyor belt, you know, and doing the same routinary task all the time. I mean, it's it's uh, basically soul crushing, right? Yeah. And so I, I do think at a certain point, labor shortage is is playing already a big role. But in general, we will be able to guarantee new job opportunities through technology that will make people be more. Um, they will use the skills better or in a better way, you know, instead of uh, doing routinary tasks or like uh, tasks that are soul crushing. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's interesting because there's a lot of arguments. Like there was a big thing a few years ago where somebody on Twitter told the truckers to learn to program or something, and it was this this yeah, big yeah, issue. And I, and one thing that I saw from that entire argument that I hadn't heard uh, talked about a lot is that the rate at which technology automates jobs is similar to the rate at which technology is automating things so that you need less technology skills to actually produce that, right? Like to write software today, uh, there's so many tools to help you do that uh, compared to 20 years ago, right? Um, so there, and there's tools to help you automate. GitHub just did a new thing that helps you with like code completion. There's all of this material out there that makes it easier to do that. Um, whereas it would be much more difficult 20 years ago. So oh, yeah. I, I'm optimistic for sure on um, the long term of automation. I think there's going to be pain in certain areas, but and it'll take some time to work that out. But that's no different than how it's been since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. every every generation we go through something, you know, industrial revolutions and, and things of that nature, we're always gaining and losing tons of of jobs. Um, because we're always looking for like the, the next thing and we're solving problems and then we put processes in place and then we move forward and solve more problems. And then we can get to things like what you're doing with, do I, how do I say, is it Oce Oceanex or Oceanix? Oceanix, yes. Oceanix? Ocean. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so then we get to things like you, it, that project, building floating cities, is only possible because it's sitting on top of immense amounts of human technology in a sense of, you know, innovations that happened over the course of, of long periods of time. Tell me a little bit about uh, what Oceanics is. Oof. So hmm. Oceanics is Oceanics is bringing the technologies that so far has been uh, um, used in a silo and is incorporating them together to solve a problem that is going to be a huge problem in the next uh, um, 10 to 15 years, actually. Uh, and that problem is not just climate change, but also seawater level rising. 
And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to use water and to uh, adapt to water, not to fight water. The idea is, um, you know, that, that goes um, um, uh, alongside with uh, a new terminology that now is becoming more popular, which is climate adaptation, right? We, we used to talk uh, a lot about climate mitigation, and we're realizing now that it's necessary to actually um, put more emphasis uh, also on climate adaptation. Like, how are we going to adapt when uh, some things will change? And uh, how are we going to adapt when certain areas of the world, because of the wet bulb condition, won't be livable anymore? Like, we're going to have entire communities that are going to be uh, relocated. Where are they going to go? Or you're going to have uh, coastal cities and coastal areas that are going to face um, a big issue, which is the seawater level rising. And so how are we going to, I would say, use the water to our advantage? And a good way is to basically, instead of fighting it, is to sit on top of it. <laughs> and in order to sit on top of it, you need the floating structures. And, um, you know, the, the, the beauty of oceanics is that we had, for the first time, integrated um, a big number of systems that allow not only safety, but allow livability, seakeeping, and uh, um, I would say um, independency. Independency from, uh, from the grid that comes from mainland. For now, um, we just uh, submitted a concept design and unveiled it at the United Nations on uh, April 26. And that showed to the world that um, we had like, a prototype of three platforms that is, can actually be completely independent from the mainland in terms of energy, in terms of water, in terms of food, uh, and in terms of uh, waste perspective. I don't know if yeah, this comes go. across on the video very well. <laughs> it's fine. I was when I was looking at your site. I was curious. How do you say that? Busan. Busan. Yes. Busan uh, is so. This is not. Re, this is not actually out there floating in the water right now. This is a three D rendering. That is correct. Okay, so it looks like there's two or three buildings that are sort of floating independently, and they're kind of connected through these walkways. Can you walk me through what this is? Yes. So um, the three platforms right now are basically programmed. When I say programmed, I mean that. On top of those sits three different programs. So we have the hotels, the one it's on your left, the first one uh, on, on the left. Yeah, that's the, uh, basically the lodging, we call it, because uh, we're trying to uh, approach um, hotelry and hospitality from a very sustainable perspective. And so lodging, first of all, uh, it's, uh, it's a better terminology from the way we're trying to approach it. But also all of the units and the, the systems themselves that are composing, basically, the, uh, the, 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 the building are completely independent and rely on energy coming from the sun and water coming from the rain, harvested from the rain and treated and uh, polished to a point where it's actually even better than the drinkable water that comes out of the faucets right now in Busan. Then we have at the center, that's uh, the housing. So that's basically the residential uh, uh, platform. And then we have the research platform, which is going to be uh, sort of a mixed-use office uh, uh, space where we're going to have research, uh, tech center, and uh, uh, offices, mostly driven by, um, in terms of research and tech, in, in relation to what is uh, the marine environment, uh, in terms of tech in, in relation to the blue technology, so related to the ocean, and from office spaces, of course, whatever is available in terms of offices. Um, and so those are the three programs right now that we have in the prototype. But the idea is to scale this uh, to more platforms. Uh, we did a, a sort of um, um, simulation for the city of Busan. There you go. Yes, that's the one. You can see how we can grow from just three platforms to um, a certain, uh, uh, like a bigger distribution of, uh, of, of floating facilities, basically, or floating habitats. I think there is a, a picture, not this one, the next one. That's correct. So you can see, right, we go from a prototype of three platforms that we can really scale these up. What are these uh, pads? There's some pads. There's like the three main structures, and then there's some pads that are kind of floating near the structures. What are these pads? Yeah, those we call them the, the pop-ups, basically. So those are, um, they can be used for uh, harvesting energy. So they can be just floating photovoltaic panels, or they are greenhouses. So basically, we use them uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, growing food using, for example, aquaponic or hydroponic technologies. 
I thought they were like party pads where people would <laughs> hang out. <laughs> well, the DA swivel also does, but not that far away from uh, from uh, from the mainland. We're trying to uh, to put them like uh, a little bit closer to the to the main prototype. In Busan's an actual city that like exists in the world currently. It does, yeah, yeah. It's in the South Korea. Uh, it's going through a lot of. Uh, um, the digitalization and renovation from a from a from a digital point of view, it's been allocated from the um, South Korean government as the sandbox for uh, the blockchain community. What you see right now, um, beside our prototype, is actually the Northport redevelopment program. So they're going to redevelop completely the Northport and transform it from what it is right now, which is a heavy commercial industrial uh, port to uh, more touristic and uh, uh, residential and retail space, basically. That's why you see all of those high-rises. Uh, you see that marina, uh, a lot of landscaping. If you look at it right now, it's completely different. This is what it's going to look like in the next five years. That's amazing. Now, and I, I especially like this because I come. I was born and raised in a, a town called Sarasota, Florida, which is a coastal town. It's a beach mm-hmm. town. <laughs> and so, I mean, we heard about, we've been hearing about sea level rise since I was born. Right, because they just track it year over year. Yeah, man, this is. Are any is anything happening like this in the United States? Like, why why isn't the United States doing amazing things like this? I mean, this is just a prototype. I mean, we we okay. had a, um, a couple of years ago. We signed an MOU with uh, uh, through the United Nations with the city of Busan, and so uh, the first prototype was basically dedicated, or I would say not just dedicated, but was due. To Busan because of their, um, they, they were they are the, basically the first adopters of uh, of um, uh, the technology. However, we are currently having conversation around the world, and not just in the United States, but um, with the other governments and countries uh, that are, you know, they're interested in understanding how this technology can help them from different perspectives. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, it's a technology that can be used everywhere, and I'm pretty sure is going to be probably used. Uh, uh, everywhere it's necessary to basically face certain uh, certain certain risks. I want to talk about cost because I'm an entrepreneur and I'm always interested in that. Let's talk about it. So <laughs> you have a you build a normal building on land. Obviously, you have to manipulate the land. You have to level it. You have to do certain things to shape the earth to build on top of it. And there's costs there, right? That's correct. And then for these, you have to build some sort of platform to then build the building on top. How do you make it so that it's realistic uh, cost-wise? Well, so the platforms right now do not touch the land. They're actually um, floating. So basically, they're made of uh, a concrete caisson, um, almost in the same way you see a ship that has voids inside, right? And you have a, you have a heel, and then you have the, the shape that basically allows to also navigate. Now, ours are not going to be, uh, they're not designed to navigate, so they don't have that specific shape. They can have a, like a flatbed on the bottom. Then there is space in between, which allows us to use it for storage or for allocating uh, areas to certain systems. And then we have the, the, top, uh, the top slab, and on top of the top slab, we build the building. So this is basically a... a a massive concrete caisson that floats and basically can adapt to wave motion, it can adapt to tides, but doesn't move laterally because we basically have set up in place uh, what we call dolphins, which are a certain type of piles that goes down into the bedrock and then stick up to a certain level. They're hidden because they are still underneath the level of the water, so that basically they don't really and create any troubles with uh, uh, visually, but also in terms of operations. And those dolphins allow to basically keep uh, the position of the platforms um, uh, from a, a lateral perspective in place. So basically, they don't, they cannot move laterally. It can actually just move vertically in order to basically adapt to tides and again waves and uh, and of course seawater level rising. That's pretty cool. Uh- What's the cost comparison of building a foundation for a building that's on land versus building the foundation for one of these buildings that's in the water? So the comparison, it's, um, it's a little hard to say in the sense that I can you know, compare number to number, but that would be not the right thing to do. And I'm saying why, because 
uh, there are certain uh, components that do not exist on buildings that will exist on, on those platforms and vice versa, right? Like uh, imagine a huge high rise in New York City, right? That's, uh, that's not really the point of uh, having uh, floating cities, right? Having such a huge structure, um, it's really physically, it will require to <laughs> change completely um, the, the structure, the way we design it right now. And in general, that's not really the, the goal that we're trying to, uh, to achieve. We're trying to achieve a sustainable um, floating city. In order to be sustainable, we need to guarantee that the right amount of people in relation to the systems that are related to that will guarantee you know, a sort of a circular economy point of view. And that means in terms of usage of uh, energy, in terms of uh, um, uh, harvesting the energy, in terms of storing the energy, as well as in terms of uh, reselling the energy if necessary to the grid. Same thing goes with the water, same thing goes with waste, and same thing goes with, uh, with food or mobility. So uh, the comparison, it's, um, it can be really challenging to do. I can tell you that the cost right now that we're facing for the prototype it's a little bit higher than what you would have as a standard building in uh, um, in uh, in uh, in Busan or as well in, in New York or in Florida, such as Miami, for example. Uh, but that's because it's a prototype. You know, um, structures like uh, skyscrapers or just more uh, normal uh, mid mid rise structures uh, tend to be a very consolidated technology that we've been doing for the last. Uh, I mean. Skyscraper is, is, has been in at least for the last hundred years, but if we talk about um, housing, it's been something that we're doing from the beginning of humanity, right? So that's really very consolidated, and that's why I think the cost right now is only driven by geographies more than uh, anything else. Uh, once we will consolidate the design through prototyping and also through basically using the data that will come from the prototype, we will be able to streamline a lot of those processes and we will be able to streamline a lot of the usage of the systems. They will be still um, driven by geographies, right? If you are in Busan, you can rely a lot on rainwater to basically harvest water. If you are in other areas of the world, you may not be able to do that because uh, it doesn't rain a lot. So you may have to rely on other systems. But um, the real cost goes into the construction. And so once we can streamline those processes using, for example, modular structures, and once we can uh, really standardize um, the size and the design of the hull, then uh, the idea is basically having something similar to what you have in, uh, in product design, right? Uh, Tesla started in the same way, having a very expensive car. Then they, sh they, you know, they start to optimize everything. The chassis is almost the same for every type of car, unless you have, of course, the SUV. And that really cut costs because you use the same one over and over again. What changes are the systems, but the system themselves are then integrated in a proper way, and that will again cut time and the cut cost. So that's the way I see going in general. And um, the fact that we are already on a similar cost level, even though a little bit higher than uh, a standard mid-rise, to me it's uh, actually very reassuring. Well, that's why I was interested because that's you're exactly right. That's how technology works. You first figure out how to just make it exist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right? true. And then once it exists, you make it better and figure out how to streamline it to reduce costs to make it available to you know more people. Um, but I was just curious, you know, I have found that the farther away the cost is, like if it was a hundred thousand, if it was a hundred times more expensive to build a floating city building than it was to build a landlocked building, um, that would mean it's you know that far off in the future. But if it's like you know, one to two times as expensive. I mean, we're going to have floating cities here. Like that, that's, that's something that's going to happen in like the next, you know, couple of years because uh, all you need is like growing up in the coastal cities, what they would talk about all the time is the cost of repairing and dealing with the encroaching water, right? So a city can easily, if it's close to a normal price of a building, I mean, you can easily justify the spend because if you don't do it, <laughs> the sea rise level is going to cause damage and you're going to pay to repair the damage and you're going to be in the exact same position where as if you did this, you could just have a floating building. Yeah, you raise a good point. It's, uh, you know, if you, if you perceive this, not just from like a direct cost, but also from an indirect cost, meaning what are the savings in making sure that we are going to adapt to what is happening and what is coming. 
instead of actually waiting too long and trying to fight and trying to continue to rehabilitate and to like uh, um, uh, refurbish areas of the coast, um, instead of just really adapting to it, it's uh, it's massive. I mean, some of those uh, federal programs cost billions of dollars, right? And uh, in comparison, that's not the cost of, uh, of of the prototype right now. So imagine what it's going to cost in the next five years or in the next uh, 10 years, right? Once uh, adaptation uh, um, become more frequent, the adopters of, uh, of this technology around the world will start to be uh, more than just Busan. I think uh, we're going to be able to really drive a little bit the change or in general um, provide a solution that is, you know, it's uh, sustainable. Because at the end of the day, a business needs to be sustainable, otherwise it's not a business, right? And it has to provide solutions and those solutions need to be sustainable as well. Yeah, I could see a city buying this from you today. Um, I'm curious to know, like, so these are, the stage you're in right now is just prototype, um, like 3D renderings. And before, hold on one second, before I go forward, I yeah. wanted to say this like six times. You have like the most amazing design team ever. So give yeah. them a huge high five because I'm a big design nerd. It is so beautiful. Like I want to live there. I see it and I'm like, I want to live there. <laughs> We, we have a we have a can I say a key cast team in uh, for yeah. the prototype we had uh, and we had so much fun I mean the last four months have been so intense but yet the result and you know the engagement from every single team member was was incredible I have to say it like every single component of the team was driven passionate. Anyway, they're also cool people to work with. So <laughs> what else do <Yeah>. you want? <laughs> oh, I know. It's a, it's a dream. I'm curious, um, time timelines. Mm -hmm. Where are we at? Ha do you have a contract to build this? Or is it something that you're waiting for? Like, when will you start construction on your first actual one that'll be in the water? So right now we have an MOU, which is a memorandum of understanding with the, uh, the city of Busan. Um, what we're trying to actually go now is through permitting. So, um, you know, there's certain, this is new for everybody. It's new also for uh, South Korea. Um, it's new for policymakers. It's new for uh, different uh, um, building departments, uh, fishery and marine department. So there are a lot of uh, um, new things that need to happen. And, uh, but the, the beauty is that there is a lot of interest. Uh, the city of Busan, their departments and ministries, the uh, this, the central government in Seoul as well, they are very interested in trying to understand how we can make this a reality from also a law perspective and a policy perspective. And so they're really helping us in uh, trying to address certain uh, bottlenecks or I would say just, uh, uh, just address areas where the law doesn't even exist for these type of structures, right? Because it will require a little bit of an open mind approach. And I have to say that um, in, in, in South Korea, I found that incredibly open-minded individuals that uh, are, belong to the government agencies that are helping us in, in going through the permitting process. That's amazing. And we do have some experience building like water-based structures. I mean, the, the oil pipelines, the, yes. the oil platforms are these massive platforms that are in the middle of the sea, right? That's correct. The beauty of, I mean, the beauty, the, the I would say easiest part from that point of view is that nobody sees them, right? Like, at the end of the day, they're in a very remote area. You know, you have uh, um, a contract if you're within uh, uh, territorial waters to basically, you know, drill and use the oil. And uh, uh, but they're there. Nobody sees them unless you work there. Um, for these floating uh, structures, they are really on the coast. You know, right? Because we're perceived as a plug-in of coastal cities. Um, we're using land. We're sorry. We're using <laughs> using water that is in front of land that is right now used where people are living, where people are passing by. And, uh, you know, it needs to be really um, addressed from that perspective, as well from the perspective that um, the idea is to stay there as a building would stay there. So for the next 75, 100 years, right? And so that will require an understanding of how the leasing process works, the financing process, uh, and all of the uh, uh, regulation processes, as well as the design, the, the, the design codes. You know, there are international guidelines, but, the, you know, there's not a, a design code that says that's a, how you should design 
um, a floating city. <laughs> so we're using like different pieces that come from uh, different uh, um, uh, international uh, codes and guidelines that are allowing us to actually make this safe, but has to be also perceived as uh, from every country you are in, those codes need to be perceived as uh, um, the right approach. Got because it. at the end of the day, a liability will need to be taken on that, right? So that's uh, that's why it's important to address all of these issues before getting into construction. So you have the MOU with Busan. You're yes. working right now with their policy and licensing and all of that to sort of figure out exactly how to put some structure around this, right? Like policy-wise. Mm-hmm. And at what point will you get to the money contract phase well, the idea that we have in our mind is to actually get there by the end of this year. That's awesome. Uh, then, you know, breaking ground and construction will, will require a little bit of an additional component of design. We're going to have to go through probably some uh, schematics, some design development. And the idea is to do this as a design build approach. So, you know, we will break ground. Break, I shouldn't even say break ground because we're not breaking ground, actually. <laughs> 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 so whatever happens with the with the foundations is gonna happen, and um, and then we're gonna approach it with a design is a design build approach. So uh, some design will continue while we're actually starting to build, and uh, um, the idea is to move along with that until uh, the the project is finished. Well, that's exciting. Well, when you break ground, let me know. I'll I'll uh, I'll bring my kids. We'll bring our our shovels and buckets and we'll help <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do it on a, on a floating platform <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> instead of a, of a shovel we're gonna use a spoon <laughs> there you go yep <laughs> we'll make it work it's, this is so awesome i mean i'm just blown away i feel like a kid in the in the candy factory i'm looking at some of these buildings and the fact that they're going to be real here in the next couple years is just it is really, really neat. You know, I think cities like San Francisco that are like known for technology that are mm-hmm. on, you know, on near water. I think those types of cities. I can deny that we 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 thought about San Francisco as well. Um, the other beautiful thing now that you're you're from Florida uh, at the United Nations roundtable when we unveiled this, uh, uh, actually the mayor Mayor Cava was uh, was present as well, and um, I had a conversation. Uh, with her in relation to safety. And, uh, you know, of course, as a, uh, rightfully so, <laughs> as a mayor, the first concern you have is um, how um, this structure behave if, uh, if a storm comes, right? And uh, are they safe? Are they going to be uh, as safe as they are when you are on land? You know, I was telling her the same thing is uh, we're, we're a plug-in to coastal cities. So coastal cities have already protected the harbor. And one of the protected harbor, for example, the one in Busan, they know that if a storm comes, a smaller vessel will actually get into the harbor because the harbor is designed to be protected and to guarantee, um, you know, uh, basically a safe haven for boats. And so the same thing will happen to the to the to the uh, Oceanics Busan because we are already in uh, in the harbor. It will be protected by the storm or protected from the storm. Yep. Because I I lived on the um, like the west coast of Florida, so it had the bay. So mm-hmm. while Miami constantly got hit with storms from the Pacific and was just devastated, we really never got anything more than you know high some high winds and rain because that bay really protects that that area of the of Florida's coast. That makes sense. That makes sense. Which yeah. makes it even more uh, enticing, right? In terms of uh, yeah. a potential spot, if. Uh, uh, we talk about floating cities. Yeah, come come to Florida, make some floating cities. That'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this is exciting. Is uh, is there anything that we didn't get to that you want to get out there to the world? I think uh, the other very important component that is very uh, keen to me is uh, that we do not only think about us in the sense of the humans, we also thought about the environment. And so we have another system in place, which we call the habitat regeneration system, that works in a way that allows the creation of a substrate right there, where the where basically the, the floating platforms uh, are, and the substrate is basically has been studied and used to uh, regenerate coral reefs. And so it's a proprietary technology through one of our partners, 
And uh, we're able to not just recreate color reef through this uh, uh, proprietary tech, but we are also able to, once the color reef is set up, um, we're actually able to attach to the coral reef seaweeds and salt marshes, any type of, uh, uh, um, let's say, marine flora. And uh, we can s expedite the growth that is five times uh, faster than uh, outside of these coral reefs. So imagine, not only we're just recreating, uh, we're creating a safe uh, environment for people to live in, but the idea is also to make sure that wherever we are, we are also recreating a safe environment uh, for the for the for the marine uh, like a, a safe habitat for marine environment. Oh yeah, that would be super important. And you know, and, and also a very important component. Um, uh, there are cities where, because of pollution and polluted waters, really became uh, uh, are an issue. We're trying to make sure that wherever we are, we're not just like a, um, being sustainable from a system perspective, but also being sustainable from an environmental perspective. And that's very important for us because uh, it's um, it's something that uh, has been you know people have been talking about it, the industry has been talking about it, but it's uh, it's important to actually apply it. And so that's uh, that's something that I think it's you know whoever is going to listen to the podcast uh, knows that we are actually doing that as well. And it's for us absolutely priority. Yes, and your website is Oce Oceanics City O C E A N I X City dot com, and you can see all the beautiful images, some 3D renderings, some videos of it. It's just beautiful and it'll break down each building and the footprint and the height and all of that good stuff. It's it's quite detailed and it's really uh, easy to look at too. It's not like too nerdy. It doesn't hurt your eyes. Like It's not like a spec sheet or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's because we have a great team of uh, graphic designers. That's why. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I think it would be horrible of me if I did not ask you some of your thoughts on on leadership because you're doing these difficult things. You have to get lots of people to work together um, in order to build something that doesn't exist. It's really tough. It's very entrepreneurial. Uh, what is your favorite leadership advice or thoughts on leadership? Oh, uh, well, I can... <laughs> I can use a sentence, which is uh, my favorite sentence. Come from, you know, I'm Italian, so it's going to be in Latin. Uh, but okay. it's, uh, it basically says, you know, um, whatever happens, just keep your, you know, your your heads up and keep going, right? And uh, so the oh yes, yeah. So the the sentence is uh, "Sic transit gloria mundi, sicut in hoc capite in eternum." I like it. it sounds beautiful. <laughs> Look, I, I do believe, you know, difficulties happen all the time. You know, life is tough. We just, uh, it's only us that we, we just grow stronger day by day. And um, once we go into endeavors that are really uh, paradigm changers, it's necessary to have, you know, uh, thick skin and big shoulders and just, uh, and just go with it. Yeah, I'm learning that a lot. I'm 34 now and I have a, I have a wife. I've got two kids and a third on the way. And... I'm always doing difficult things and trying to like push push the boundaries. But one one thing that I've noticed with everything that's happened since the pandemic, from the pandemic itself to the wars, and it's really put a premium on your ability to focus on what's going right, um, to stay optimistic, and to not get sucked down into like a negativity pit, right? And and so I've I've just noticed myself. Um, it's important in leadership too, right? But I've noticed that it's a it's like a muscle that I've been been working on. And I think lately, over the past three years for humanity, uh, that's something that a lot of people have had to work harder at. No, that's very true. That's absolutely very true. Yeah. So, so I like your quote because it helps with that, right? <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I made it easy in the sense that, you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, of course, just keep going, right? It's, that's easy to say it. And it's true. It's easy to say it. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, being uh, pers perseverant and uh, continue to persevere on, on your road and your path, you know, intelligently, not just uh, uh, blindly, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important. It's actually probably the, the key of achieving what you want to achieve. Yes, and I second that because uh, 
when I started, I, I didn't know anything. And so what I thought was, okay, I don't know enough to be smart about what I'm doing, but if I just go after it blindly, really, really, really hard, I was so inefficient or whatever, but I got something going. And then once you get something going, uh, you can you can really refine it. But yeah, it's... Yeah, then you adapt. Yeah, yes. I like I like you, Mateo. And that's how, I'm saying your name correctly, right? It's Mateo? Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Cool. Cool. Man, this is fantastic. I want to have you on uh, like maybe next year when you've made some progress with uh, permitting or wherever you're at next year so that we can keep updating the audience on the status of of this project because I'm super excited about it. I would be glad to actually participate again. Um, Amazing. The other thing I want to say, if I actually forgot, because it's important, I've been seeing a lot of comments from uh, our um, videos on YouTube and our Instagram mm-hmm. accounts and etc., and they are are actually legit comments, right? Every time you see these cities, uh, you're perceived as the guy or the group that is uh, creating a safe haven for the riches, right? Oh, really? And uh, yes, it's a, it's it's a it's a common trend, and I can understand why you can be you can be perceived as that. But I I'm trying to say is for us, it's very important to share the fact that we're trying and we're designing actually these cities to be as much inclusive as possible. We have allocated, as per the UN requirements, 20% of housing to affordable housing. And the same goes into the lodging. The lodging has four layers of pricing so that everybody can actually stay, sleep, and you know, enjoy uh, the, the lodging on, on, on one of the platforms. And the same goes with the with the residential. So for us, it's very important to actually share this. This is not like a safe haven for the riches. This is for everybody. We're trying to guarantee and to create a solution that is good for everybody. Yeah. Although I would support you if it was a safe haven for the riches, because back to the <laughs> Tesla business model, you have to get it out there to reduce the cost. I mean, you just do. It's just part of the world that we live in. Yeah. And that's, that's uh, you know, I, I would say that that works very well when you have a, a specific product like a car, right? Because it's, uh, it's really commoditized. And so it really allows you to, um, to reach a, a wider a clientele. When you have um, cities, you know, even though you might end up having some investors coming from overseas or from other, places, other, other areas of the country, um, you don't want to end up with an empty shell where nobody's living in it. Right. This has to be used. I mean, the idea is to actually have something that is used and can show and prove a concept. And so it's important for us that because we're very much geographically driven, you know, we're going to be in a certain place. And once we we build it, it's going to be there for a long time. Um, We want to make sure that is used by like from everybody. And that means uh, you can, you know, can go and have walks. Uh, People with different incomes will actually have the access to it. It's, it's really a, a city for everybody. And that's what we want to really reinforce as a concept. Well, absolutely. Especially if governments are backing it, right? I mean, if you make a public space, you can, there's no reason why one of those things can't be public space, right? And you can go for a walk there. I mean, we have in, in uh, Sarasota, there's a place called Marina Jacks. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, got this one area where there's a, um, a harbor, mm-hmm. and there's sort of a peninsula that comes out, and then on that there's a running track around it. There's a splash park. There's benches. It's it's manicured in the sense that like it's landscaped really well, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you can see the water like all around you. And it's a nice public space. I mean, and you kind of have to you know walk a little bit out to it, but you know the only difference between that public space and a floating one is just what's underneath it, <laughs> right? That's true. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Dude, this is cool, man. This is so neat. I'm so glad we've got smart people on this planet that are pushing forward things like this. Thank you. <laughs> well, look, my pleasure. And, uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge the fact that it's me here speaking, but um, it wasn't done by Matteo. This was a project done by the whole team. Now, I would love to have every single one of them with me here because um, it really requires uh, global effort 
from people from everywhere. We had uh, uh, Korean teams, we had uh, um, our American team, we, have, we even had the Italians, actually. <laughs> One of the team was uh, directly from Italy. So it's, it's important to reinforce this. You don't do this alone. And uh, um, in general, nothing as complicated as that can be done alone. 100%. Absolutely. And I'm sure they're really great people because typically great people attract great people, especially when you're doing new difficult things. You need like premium human beings to do that. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's absolutely true. They're great people with great energy. So let's keep going. 